When you were in the state senate, you talked about licensing and registering guns and gun owners. Would you do that as president? I, I, I don't think that we can get that done. Senator McCain says that Obama has changed his position on gun control to suit the mood of the country. What do you think? Well, it's the same old Washington political talk that we get from the McCain campaign every day. Uh, I think our statements have been crystal clear on this. Again, he supports law-abiding gun owners and their right to, to bear arms. And I think that's what he'll, that's the right that he'll uphold as president. Uh, and I think that's what he talked about today. Obama's anti-gun record is long. In 2004, he voted against legislation drafted to protect homeowners from prosecution in cases where they used a firearm to halt a home invasion. In 2003, he voted in support of legislation that would have effectively banned most of the privately held hunting shotguns, target rifles, and black powder rifles in Illinois. Senator Obama, the District of Columbia has a law, it's had a law since 1976, it's now before the United States Supreme Court, that prohibits ownership of handguns, a sawed-off shotgun, a machine gun, or a short-barreled rifle. Is that a law consistent with an individual's right to bear arms? Well, Charlie, I confess I obviously haven't listened to the briefs and looked at all the evidence. Uh, as a general principle, I believe that the Constitution uh, confers an individual right uh, to bear arms. But just because you have an individual right does not mean that the state or local government can't constrain the exercise of that right. President Obama, during the Democratic National Convention in 2008, you stated you wanted to keep AK-47s out of the hands of criminals. What has your administration done or planned to do to limit the availability of assault weapons? But I also believe that a lot of gun owners would agree that AK-47s belong in the hands of soldiers, not in the hands of criminals. that they belong on the, the battlefield of war, not on the streets of our cities. Uh, and, you know, in the same way that we have a right to private property, but local governments can uh, establish zoning ordinances that determine how you can use it. Uh, and I think that it is going to be important for us to reconcile what are two realities in this country. There's the reality of gun ownership uh, and the tradition of gun ownership that's passed on from generation to generation. Uh, you know, when you listen to people who uh, are, have, have hunted uh, and they talk about the fact that they went hunting with their fathers or their mothers. And so I respect the right of lawful gun owners to hunt, fish, protect their families. I respect that. You know, we're a nation that believes in the Second Amendment. And I believe in the Second Amendment. You know, we've got a long tradition of, of hunting and sportsmen uh, and people who want to make sure they can protect themselves. I, like most Americans, believe that the Second Amendment guarantees an individual the right to bear arms. I think we recognize the traditions of gun ownership that passed on from generation to generation, that hunting and shooting are part of a, a, a cherished national heritage then that is something that is deeply important to them and culturally but, they care about deeply but you also have the reality of what's happening here in Philadelphia and what's happening in Chicago look in my hometown of Chicago on the south side of Chicago we've had 34 gun deaths last year uh, of Chicago public school children uh, but there have been too many instances during the course of my presidency where I've had to comfort families who've lost somebody, most recently out in Aurora. Uh, and I think that most law-abiding gun owners all across America would recognize that it is perfectly appropriate for uh, local communities and states and the federal government to try to figure out how do we stop that kind of killing. We've done a much better job in terms of background checks, but we've got more to do when it comes to enforcement. But I also share your belief that weapons that were designed for soldiers in war theaters don't belong on our streets. Uh, uh, and, but do you, still, do you still favor the registration of guns? Do you still favor the licensing of guns? And, and in 1996, 
you, your campaign issued a questionnaire, and your writing was on the questionnaire that said you favored a ban on handguns. No, that, my writing wasn't on that particular questionnaire, Charlie. As I said, the I have never favored uh, all out ha uh, ban on handguns. And in 1996, Obama supported a ban on the manufacture, sale, and possession of handguns. But now, Obama's running for president and claims no knowledge of this, even though his handwriting is all over it. Because, frankly, in my hometown of Chicago, there's an awful lot of violence. And they're not using AK-47s, they're using cheap handguns. Uh, what I think we can provide is common sense uh, approaches to uh, the issue of illegal guns that are ending up on the streets. We can make sure that criminals don't have guns in their hands. We can make certain that those uh, who are mentally uh, deranged are not getting hold of handguns. I believe the majority of gun owners would agree that we should do everything possible to prevent criminals and fugitives from purchasing weapons. That we should check someone's criminal record before they can check out a gun seller. That a mentally unbalanced individual should not be able to get his hands on a gun so easily. These steps shouldn't be controversial, they should be common sense. And so what I want is a, is a comprehensive strategy. Part of it is seeing if we can get automatic weapons that kill folks in amazing numbers out of the hands of criminals and the mentally ill. So my belief is that, A, we have to enforce the laws we've already got, make sure that we're keeping guns out of the hands of criminals, those who are mentally ill. So I'm going to continue to work with members of both parties and with religious groups and with civic organizations to arrive at a consensus around violence reduction. We can trace guns that have been used in crimes to unscrupulous gun dealers that may be selling to straw purchasers and dumping them on the streets. The point is, is that what we have to do is get beyond the politics of this issue and figure out what in fact is working. That if there's violence on the streets, that working with faith groups and law enforcement, we can catch it before it gets out of control. We're not going to eliminate everybody who is mentally disturbed and we've got to make sure that they don't get weapons. Barack Obama believes that many Americans simply cling to guns in times of economic distress. Speaking behind closed doors to an audience of San Francisco donors, Barack Obama said they cling to guns or religion as a way to explain their frustrations. And so what I'm trying to do is to get a broader conversation about how do we reduce the violence generally. Part of it is seeing if we can get an assault weapons ban reintroduced, but part of it is also looking at other sources of the violence. But part of it is also going deeper and seeing if we can get into these communities and making sure we catch violent impulses before they occur. Disarming the American people, Obama operatives in the Congress have introduced more than 10 bills that would end the Second Amendment as we know it. H.R. 1022 would allow the new Attorney General Eric Holder the dictatorial power to ban any gun he wishes at will. In 2008, before the Supreme Court, in the D.C. gun ban case, District of Columbia versus Heller, Holder argued for the complete disarmament of the American people and that only the military should own firearms. H.R. 257 would ban all youth shooting sports, including YMCA and Youth Olympic shooting clubs. H.R. 45 would force all gun owners to undergo federal psychological screening, registration and testing to keep their firearms. White House Chief of Staff Rahm Emanuel has proposed the extrajudicial banning of any American on the fraudulent no-fly list from owning any firearm. That is, if you are on the no-fly list because you are known as maybe a possible terrorist, you cannot buy a handgun in America. Over 25,000 Americans are added each month to the no-fly list, which numbers over a million people who have not been charged or convicted of any crime. It's a case of mistaken identity for a five-year-old boy from Normandy Park. 
He had trouble boarding a plane because someone with his same name is wanted by the federal government. King 5's Mimi Jung is live at SeaTac Airport to explain. Mimi. Lori, it's hard to believe that a five-year-old could be considered a threat, but that's exactly what happened here at SeaTac last week when Matthew Gardner showed up for a flight to LAX. Then they fly on As five-year-olds go, Matthew Gardner is about as harmless as you can get. But when he and his mom checked in for their flight at SeaTac last week, Matthew was considered the criminal. If you're on that no-fly list, your access to the right to bear arms is canceled because you're not part of the American family. You don't deserve that right. There is no right for you if you're on that terrorist list. And even though this Matthew Gardner is only in kindergarten, TSA workers still conducted a full-blown search. Here they searched all of our belongings. They took everything apart piece by piece. Um, Nadia Counter says it wasn't easy being treated as a possible threat to national security. I picked up my child to give him a hug and tell him, you know, it's okay, we're doing fine. And they reported to me that I was not allowed to touch him. He was a security risk, and um, they had to re-search me to make sure that I had not um, obtained any materials from him. Senator Obama agreed with the Supreme Court decision today to strike down Washington, D.C.'s gun law? Well, he, he acknowledges and he's always said that uh, an individual has a right to bear arms. That's one of the things that the court decided today. The court also said that communities throughout the country can set reasonable safety measures that they deem necessary. The court ruled today that Washington had gone too far, but the important thing that the court did agree on today was one, something that Barack uh, believes in, which is an individual's right to bear arms, as well as communities that can set reasonable and common sense safety measures as long as those two uh, equal up. And I think that's the guidance that the Supreme Court offered cities throughout the country today. Freedom is our birthright. It doesn't come from the government. It is part of our humanity. America is the only country in the history of the world dedicated to the truism that we are endowed by our creator, as Jefferson wrote, with certain inalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The government has forgotten basic civics. Endowed by our creator means that our rights come from God, not from the feds. Inalienable means that we and our freedoms cannot be separated unless we are convicted by a jury of violating someone else's rights. What is the value of being safe if we are not free? Did our forefathers free the kings and despots of Europe in order to come here and be safe? Did Patrick Henry say, give me safety or give me death? Here is the mistake that the big government progressive crowd wants to thrust upon us. They want us to balance liberty and safety. There is no such thing as balance when it comes to freedom. We will not trade freedom for anything or balance it against anything. And we certainly won't give it up to the TSA. Can the government keep us safe? I don't think so. I think airline travel is safer today because pilots have guns, because cockpit doors are now like bank vaults, and because the passengers have become courageous. All this was done by individuals in the private sector and not by the government. I've said it before, I'll say it again. If the feds had not stripped us of our natural rights to keep ourselves safe by keeping and bearing arms, 9-11 would never have happened. How about letting the airlines decide who gets on their plane rather than a TSA worker who leaves his post? When industry competes for your business, you fly where you want to go to. You get there in comfort and safety, and you do all of this at a competitive cost. When the government runs the show, you stand in the cold night for six hours because of a kiss. The government can't deliver the mail. It can't operate security cameras at an airport. It can't pay back its debts. It can't tell the truth. Why would you want to give up the one tool that allows you to protect your life, your children's lives, and your property without, without any, you know, serious danger. I believe in common sense uh, gun safety laws, and I believe in the Second Amendment. Uh, and so uh, lawful gun owners have nothing to fear. It says it right there, lawful gun owners have nothing to fear. So what gives you cause to believe that he could cave in to pressure against people who are against the Second Amendment? Well, Hillary Clinton said during the campaign, she said that he was only saying he was pro-Second Amendment to get votes. And she pointed out his record before he started running for president, mm -hmm. where he said he was for a handgun ban, a semi-auto ban, 
He said he was in favor of overturning the 40 states that have right to carry laws. He said he was in favor of a 500 percent increase in the excise tax on firearms and ammunition. That's $350 federal tax on a $500 rifle. And he also voted in the Senate to put the American firearms industry out of business through those nuisance lawsuits. So I think a lot of American uh, supporters of the Second mm -hmm. Amendment are suspicious and justifiably so on what he's actually going to do.